that we're all connected and that love and compassion for all living beings, including things like pigs and cows. It's a lack of love and compassion for them, which, which is destroying the destruction of ourselves and the planet. And so love and compassion for other living beings, from where there is a pig in America to orangutans in Indonesia, all that is going to benefit us. And because, as I would mentioned before, it's not the environment versus the economy. We have exploitative economies now, which pass the true cost of production onto the powerless. Non-recognized persons such as orangutans, indigenous communities, powerless people, as an example. But more importantly, in, in the context, is future generations. We're passing on the true cost of production to future generations. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi. I want to start today's episode by asking you a favor. You see, reviews and star ratings, thumbs up, they all affect how well a podcast does. So if you like today's discussion, and if you've been a listener for a while, I encourage you to go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and just write that rating. Go ahead and give us five stars, that thumbs up, and a written review wherever you listen and wherever that's possible. It will do worlds for helping us. Thank you so very much. Now, I want to invite you as we are commencing today's discussion to think about what inspires you, what gets under your skin, what propels you into action. For me, when I ask myself that question, I am brought back to my youth when I was just a little girl who learned that my grandmother had been diagnosed with skin cancer, a disease to which she would later succumb. You see, I sought to understand what was happening to her. I started to read research, literally picking up medical journals and articles that were not intended for the lay public at just nine years old. I learned what an LD50 level was, and that's the rate at which 50% of animals in a study would die. I learned that monkeys and apes that I revered were often used in research studies for radiation therapy against cancers and things like that. Ken, I was nine years old. I was overwhelmed. I didn't want to live in a world where we took so much for granted, where we took animals for granted. So I decided to do something about it. Um, there was a lab in my home state of Oregon that was doing research at the time on rhesus macaques. So I went out and collected thousands of signatures going door to door at my school, even sitting in front of the grocery store and collecting signatures that way. You know the drill. It's that, hey, want to get something on the ballot? I want to get something on the ballot so we can vote on it. And while I was successful on getting something on the ballot, while that effort didn't end animal testing, it did become part of a larger movement that would ultimately shift us away from doing so many research studies on primates. It probably also led to my study of anthropology, primatology, evolution, archaeology, I spent quite a bit of time studying primates. I learned to identify species from their bones. I've dissected their bodies and prepared skeletons of chimpanzees for use in primatology labs, seeking to understand them, seeking to understand man's closest relatives on this planet. One of those chimpanzees was even a chimpanzee that Jane Goodall had studied in the wild. So why am I talking about this origin story today? I just think it's important that we consider what inspires us to act, what gets under our skin, what makes us happy, what makes us ultimately have that spring in our step and align our purpose with our passion. That's ultimately what this podcast is about. It's inviting you to care more about specific issues so that we can all create a better world together so that we can do this collectively. And it also touches on the subject that we're going to dive into today with our guest, Leif Cox. You see, Leif Cox, he is the organizer and founder of the Orangutan Project, 
again, a primate, getting me thinking about all of my history, right? Um, he's got a very interesting history, an interesting story. And when we come together in today's discussion, we talk about many things that connect to orangutans. But moreover, it's what connects us to collective action, to happiness, to creating a better future, to, yes, preserving these rainforests that the orangutan would live within, but also what it's like to live with one another, to protect and preserve the future for all species, to shifting away from extractive processes and capitalism. Our discussion lends in so many different directions, but it all comes back to that one thing. How do we live as a community? How do we remain inspired? How do we connect with and commune with nature? And how do we create that future that we want to live in where all people and planet can thrive and prosper? It's a beautiful story. So let me tell you for a moment about the Orangutan Project. For over three decades, world-renowned orangutan expert Leif Cox has worked to secure the survival of critically endangered orangutans. He's an outspoken campaigner on their behalf. He's a key player in developing plans for their protection, including leading the first ever successful reintroduction of a zoo-born orangutan into the wild. I'm going to actually be interviewing one of his collaborators in the future to really talk about that reintroduction, to tell you the story of what it took. He's a small population biologist, and Leif has a master's degree studying orangutans. He's been awarded Curtin University's highest award for achievement, has published several academic papers and books on orangutans, and is the author of the Amazon bestseller, Orangutans, My Cousins, My Friends. In 2020, Leif was awarded the Order of Australia for his outstanding work in the field of wildlife conservation. So I'm thrilled that I get to share this conversation with you today, introduce you to Leif Cox, to the Orangutan Project, and to how we can all commune together and create stronger change and ultimately live a happier life too. So with that, here's that conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to the show, Leif. Oh, great to be here. Thank you. So as I alluded to in my intro, I've got a bit of experience there, nowhere near what you've experienced, but I did spend some time even studying populations of orangutan in local zoos and being inside the cage with them, so to speak. And sadly, that's that's their life, right? Within a cage. Mm -hmm. at a zoo. So I'd love to start with just the story of what inspired you in the first place to venture on this study of orangutans and other primates. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity, you know, many years ago now to work with 15 orangutans. And um, I had the, the, the absolute beautiful opportunity of having no training at all. Mm. And so I was given the diet sheet and told how to move the slides and that was it. And so I got to learn them from a, a, a very objective opinion with now any um, pre learning i guess about who and what they are and so it wasn't until later that people told me that orangutans were dangerous and they could hurt you and that sort of stuff so i would just go and have my lunch with them and and be their friends and you know and um be there when they had their babies and you know, nurse their babies and looked after them and so developed a very close personal friendship with these orangutans um and then, and then obviously discovered that they're self-aware persons and they didn't belong in captivity. And of course, quickly discovered that um, as a species, they've been driven to extinction in the most horrible ways that we can imagine being machete to death and burnt alive and, you know, and, and various other ways, unfortunately. And so that started my lifelong journey, not only to help the welfare of orangutans, um, but to preserve their species in the wild and obviously then lead on to the journey of getting many of these orangutans back into the wild where it's the only place they can really thrive and live meaningful lives. Yeah. Well, as you've mentioned, the um, orangutans have met their end a number of ways, none of them pretty. Um, and I, I think if people have spent some time you know, even watching some feature films like that about Diane Fossey, 
studying the gorillas or um, really Jane Goodall's work with chimpanzees, they get to know that there's issues of poaching, there's issues of deforestation through burning simply because they want to plant more palm. Um, and the palm kernel oil is then used in our food production. It's used in the creation of vitamin A. It's used in almost every peanut butter you see on the shelf even. And while some is marketed as orangutan safe, I've simply felt like supporting the problem of, you know, that palm kernel oil in the first place is supporting the problem of orangutan habitat degradation. What are your feelings about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there's, there's two aspects to it is, you know, palm oil is grown as a monoculture, which has always destroyed rainforest yep. for its production. And, and therefore, having sustainable palm oil is that it actually a myth, you know, and, and doesn't hold up to science. So because all monocultures will eventually destroy the environment for which they are grown. And that's not just true for palm oil, but all um, monocultures. So it, it's never sustainable and it's never a good idea. It's about um, exploitation of the rich um, against the many, against the environment, the local community and future generations. So it's something as individuals we should avoid participating in as much as possible as consumers. However, the flip side to it is um, running palm oil campaigns or um, advocating for certified or sustainable palm oil, which doesn't exist, um, actually doesn't really help the problem at all because it's not understanding the true driver of deforestation and the killing of orangutans. The forests are destroyed primarily for the value of the trees, which then finance the most economically viable um, short-term way of using that land. And that can be palm oil, but many times it's pulp paper, rubber plantations, or coal mine as, as examples. So by addressing a particular commodity that replaces the rainforest, we will not actually stop any trees from being destroyed and orangutans being killed. And, and so we have to recognize maybe that as individuals, we may choose not to um, support the, um, the companies destroying the rainforest through palm oil consumption. However, in order to save the rainforest, it will take a far more focused um, application of, of intelligent compassion um, to achieve the aim. Well, let's talk for a moment about the relatively small habitat that they actually have left to them. Um, now, share with our audience where in the world the orangutan lives in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, although, you know, in prehistory, um, orangutan existed all the way up in southern China and all the way down to the island of Java. Um, it only now lives on two islands, the island of Sumatra and Borneo. Borneo is, is, at, is owned by two nations, um, Malaysia and Indonesia, and Sumatra is a purely Indonesian island. And the vast majority of the rainforest has been destroyed and pulp papered. And, and so we're really fighting over the last remaining scraps of rainforest um, on these two islands and only have the next decade to ensure that we can actually conserve enough ecosystems and the right type, shape and size of rainforest to allow the rainforest to survive because you need a certain shape and type and size of rainforest for the rainforest to be sustainable but also that the critically endangered species such as orangutans can survive in viable populations. Um, so this is our mission, is to save up to eight ecosystems of the right type, shape and size of rainforest in the next decade before it's too late. Otherwise, yes, there'll certainly be rainforest in fragmented patches or orangutan populations in small fragmented areas that are unsustainable. Um, however, both the rainforest and the orangutan populations will spiral to extinction over time unless we can act in this decade. So let's talk about the orangutan and what's so unique and special about them. Um, you know, I always marveled at the fact that they are actually quite large and yet able to remain almost purely arboreal, separating their weight between four mm -hmm. limbs perfectly within the canopy of the forest. 
Um, but I also understand that their life cycle is such that it takes a while to get to sexual maturity. They don't tend mm -hmm. to have offspring every year. So, you know, how can we help their populations rebound? Let's say, mm -hmm. assuming we're able to protect enough of the rainforest for their habitat. Yeah, yeah. Well, they actually are, as you indicate, in a slow species in the world, reproducing species in the world. And there's three species, so it's, it's hard to talk about all of them in, in, in one podcast. But let's just, as an example, the Sumatran orangutan has its babies first at 15, and there's nine years between individual infants. Now, why is this the case? Why they reproduce so slowly? It's because they actually adapt to the environment primarily through culture, not natural selection, as um, more lower animals primarily do. And so they're born, like us, with vacant brains, um, virial instinct, and the mother, over a long training period, programs a culture about what food, what medicines, what dangers exist in the rainforest, which allows them to uniquely adapt to the ever-changing environment far quicker than natural selection alone can, can do. Now, this is a fantastic system for intelligent beings to adapt to the environment. Of course, this is one of the reasons humans are so, so successful. However, it can only really occur when there's no natural predator. Because if you kill only 1% of the females of, of orangutans in a viable population a year, that population will quickly spiral to extinction. Um, and of course, orangutans have been introduced um, after their evolution to these beautiful species to the super predator, humans. And this has initially led to their population decline through low level hunting. Um, and then the, the period of resistance of the species destruction, the absolute wholesale destruction of 80% of the habitat in the last 20 years in, in industrial scale destruction of the rainforest has driven to the point of um, being critically endangered and one step away from extinction. So as we learn a, a bit about the orangutan and why it would be so challenging for their populations to rebound, I would love for you to just tell us more about what we can do to help and what the orangutan project in particular is doing to both raise awareness and ensure that these populations are protected. Mm -hmm. the, the first question, the second part of that question I'll answer first, which is, what are we doing? And so what we're doing is we're saving up to eight ecosystems, depending on how much money we can um, get from our donor base, eight ecosystems, right type, shape and size rainforest. Because the vast majority of um, areas which become conservation forests, such as national parks, are fairly useless for wildlife. It's the hills and the mountain areas, which are good for water catchment and, and not very useful for, let's say, converting to palm oil plantations. But orangutans, tigers, and elephants, and indigenous communities as well, need the lowland riverine forest to survive. And so getting the right forest in the right size and shape is extremely important. And unfortunately, after this decade, we won't have the opportunity, there won't be enough viable ecosystems to piece together. So that's our main game. Now, a lot of these areas do not have viable population orangutans anymore because of hunting as an example. And so what we're also doing, we're rescuing orangutans, um, rehabilitating them and, um, and reintroducing them into these ecosystems so a viable population can occur again. Now, because there's two things which are happening. One is we need the area for orangutans to survive, but we also need the genetic diversity. And when you have a critically endangered species such as orangutans, every individual becomes an important genetic resource that supports the survival of the species. So it's no longer a welfare or a conservation issue. Welfare and conservation are the same thing because if we can support the welfare of the individuals, allow them to survive and breed and go back to the wild, we also support the species. Now, what can we do as individuals? Well, by myself, not much. I, I, I certainly believe, unfortunately, um, the only way human beings can ever achieve anything is through collectivization. As, in, as individuals, we don't hold much knowledge and, and much power. However, 
we have been very successful and continue to be successful if we're willing to collectivize. And there's two ways we can collectivize. One is we can collectivize our capital. As any smart person knows, they can earn a decent living by getting a job. But if they want to earn a lot of money, they collectivize capital into a, what we call a company and they can make a lot of money. Um, similarly, any, any person can know that they could probably try to have better working conditions and wages through asking a boss for them. Good luck with that. Um, but if they collectivize in a union, they can actually make large, meaningful changes. And so it's only really through collectivization that through either our labor, in this case, volunteering or supporting with your skills to survive the rain tanks or your capital. You know, you, 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 you have a, a, had some affluence and able to return some of your affluence um, back into causes which are going to make the meaningful change that you want in the world. And through those two ways, we can really make the meaningful change. But there's two other aspects I just want to highlight. This is the most important decade in human history. And I'm not being flippant with that. The human species has been around in the current form for at least 200,000 years. But if you live in any decade at any time before now, you would have less influence on the outcome of the planet in future generations. This is the most important decade. And secondly, the vast majority of people on this planet are either too poor or living in totalitarian regimes have, and have no ability to, cap, to um, collectivize their capital and labor to make meaningful change. And so we're actually representing a privileged few in the most important time in history that can do so much good um, and so it's not only a large challenge, it's also an incredible privilege for us to be able to um, make the meaningful changes in this time in history. Now, I think that you bring up some really important points. We are in a critical decade, absolutely. Um, we see that we're approaching, in a way, uh, well, that two degree threshold where the climate simply gets too warm and we have these vast weather changes that come through entire ecosystems around the planet that affects our oceans and everything, really. So I think at times like this, it can, it can start to feel all like it's just too much, it's overwhelming, and like there's so much work to be done that even getting to a point where we can preserve enough of that rainforest, rainforest um, for the rainforest to exist for a decade mm -hmm. can feel like it's unlikely. So mm -hmm. what hope would you have to share with our audience? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's two aspects to that question. Um, one is, look, we have a huge challenge, but in this next decade, we do have the, we can turn this around, we can make it happen. So it's not impossible. It's just extremely challenging. And, and therefore, it's, it's, it's beholden on us as a privileged few in this decade to make this meaningful change. The, the, the second aspect to it is um, I'm not a big advocate for hope, surprisingly. <laughs> I actually think hope comes with this, its consort despair. Mm -hmm. That's not a very good way of, of acting in life. What I am is for is, is finding a joy, happiness within ourselves. And then that will naturally have to express itself. We, you know, and so, so the change is actually is not reliant on external factors of success and failure, um, which will inevitably, especially in conservation, which I described as a marathon with hurdles, with professional boxer punching you in the face every hundred meters. You know, if you're living on hope, <laughs> you're, you're you're really going to be quivering in the corner very quickly. However. If you're filled with love and compassion and that needs to express itself in an intelligent way, you will keep going. And, and, and therefore, you'll have the energy uh, and the stamina to see this project through in, over the next decade. And so, and the wonderful thing about this is it, it's all, if not about wildlife versus people, environment versus economy, all along the way, you're achieving meaningful outcomes for sentient beings. Those around you, the people that you work with, enriching their lives um, by empowering them to, to give you know, and to care, which ultimately brings joy and love and happiness to ourselves. 
every individual orangutan and elephant and in, in ch indigenous community child that we feed and educate and give opportunity is, is a wondrous outcome in itself, you know, and then to bring that all together um, to make a better future for not only orangutans, elephants, tigers and the indigenous communities working with, but through protecting the rainforest, we're doing the most cost effective thing we can do to mitigate climate change and make a better world for everybody on this planet. And so it is absolutely, in some senses, absolutely wondrous, doesn't make sense, and joyful um, that we, we can bring so much happiness and joy and you know, security, safety, and opportunity to so many living beings. Well, I have to say, having spent some time in rainforests and Australia and even, you know, in the redwood forests, which essentially are rainforest ecosystems themselves, of course, they look slightly different than more of these tropical environment rainforests. The moisture in the air keeps the area cooler and actually keeps water in the soil. Then you have microbes and you have fungi that help to break it down and protect that water that's there and to ultimately ensure that we're sequestering more carbon. So ultimately these forests, they are havens for clean air, for water resources and to ensure that we have a healthier planet and healthier ecosystems all around. And then they house a myriad of species that are interconnected in a way that we can't fully understand. And we're, if we just spend some time in that space and in that nature, we can come to appreciate even with a lack of understanding that we might have. It's my belief that if we can really educate ourselves on that one piece and get into nature in our own backyards, that we can gain an appreciation for that and move ourselves into action so that we can support these sorts of initiatives in spaces around the globe that we might not be able to personally touch but which we have a greater understanding for. So I uh, just applaud what you're doing. I would like to know, you know, what specifically it is that you're looking to do with the Orangutan project when it comes to these eight forests. Are you securing land? Are you um, collaborating with would-be farmers to move them into different spaces? What is it specifically that you're undertaking? Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a complex answer, mm -hmm. um, but that's not often very satisfying to us because we love s simple <laughs> solutions. Right. And I always say for every complex problem in the world, there's a simple solution, which is absolutely wrong. That's just not how you solve things in the world. So what we do is we look at each ecosystem and diagnose the disease and we supply the medicine in the right dosage and, and the right medicine. So it's like if you don't, if you go to your doctor and it gives you the same medicine and the same dosage for every disease you, 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 you present to him, you should realize he's a crack. And conservation is the same thing. <laughs> so it's a very big mixture. It's about land leasing. We're leasing, you know, um, vast tracts of land, you know, for 100 years, these 100 year leases. Um, we're strategically purchasing some land. Um, we, we have MOUs with um, um, local officials to, to actually genuinely protect land which is already legally protected. We're actually piecing together intelligently the ecosystem's right type. Can side. we stop there for a minute? We're, because you said mm -hmm. genuinely protect. So that, that means that there's a problem there. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a space where there's supposedly a protection in place, but it's either not enforced or there are poaching issues or something else. Can you talk more about that issue? Yeah, that, that, that's correct, you know, so, um, that, you know, that, you know, I, there's one organization which comes to mind who, you know, got awards for creating a national park in Indonesia, which is now two thirds of farm or plantation. So, you know, create a national park, tick, move on. Right? We'll come right so, back to that palm so, oil issue. And, and, and so, why so, 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 exactly. I just tell people, like, you look at your peanut butter, start there. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah. buy the stuff that has palm kernel oil in it. Yeah. So you have organizations who they, their remit is to change the status of, of rainforest from unprotected to protected, tick and move on. You go, well, yeah, but <laughs> you're only addressing one part of the, the, the mosaic of actions, you know. And so so it's and it really depends on the particular area as well. So so we have ranges, you know, to employ to go in and protect the areas, you know, that um, and to ensure that they're actually genuinely um, protected. 
Um, then the other aspect to it is the other victims of it are the Indigenous communities who land rights haven't been recognised and the big multinationals have just taken all the land for pulp paper and palm oil. And um, their way of life, such as hunter and gathering or slash and bone agriculture, has been sustainable over centuries because they've been operating over a large enough area to make that sustainable. Now those two ways of life are unsustainable, not due to fault of their own. And so we're working with them to develop new agricultural systems under the rainforest canopy so they can prosper. And yeah, and and in the areas that we, we started working with, we come in and they don't name their children at birth, they name them at six because they're unlikely to survive. The children are malnourished and uneducated. Um, their brains are not developing due to lack of nutrition. And when we educate them and give them two meals a day, um, provide a midwife, you know, and then help them transition um, respectively over to new agricultural systems, we're allowing them to then become sustainable in, in their remaining environment. And then the ultimate aim is to hand over in 10 years time as the custodians of this land, empowered custodians, because no, you're handing over land to people who have no power, <laughs> you know, because, you know, um, you know, so often they think, well, you know, indigenous rights might be, you know, the way to go and hand it over to, but if, if their way of life is no longer sustainable, because no fault of their own, or they have no power to protect the area, Again, you know, it, uh, these very simple one size fit all solutions don't ever work. You have to provide the whole framework and mosaic. And this is what we're trying to achieve with all our, you know, wonderful on the ground partners who, you know, working day in and day out in the rainforest um, to piece together these ecosystems. So each species and subspecies of orangutans have the opportunity to live in their own culture in sustainable populations in the wild. And those, hopefully those ecosystems are obviously large enough, as you suggested, they, they produce their own rain, they produce their own humidity uh, and biodiversity. So the rainforest and the population within it will be sustainable. Now, that's not going to be enough to save the planet. We have to rewild at least 25 to 30 percent of the planet for the planet to stabilise and support the, the environment and the economy for future generations. However, at least these ecosystems will provide the basic fundamental resource to allow that rewilding to occur, rather than um, leaving just small islands of biodiversity which are collapsing, um, but before future generations can um, stabilize this, this planet for all living beings. So just for the audience here, um, rewilding is a big topic. I have interviewed Paul Hawken on his book, Regeneration, Ending the Climate Crisis in One Generation. And there's an entire section in that book on rewilding. I did cover in about a 20 minute episode, some keys to rewilding an area, but we need to understand too, that it's not just setting aside unproductive land. You need to set aside land that can be productive in order to ensure that we are giving ourselves and our planet the resources it needs to thrive and that could be rewilding grasslands that could be rewilding forests that could be you know taking land and and using a more regenerative approach to your agriculture so that you are sequestering carbon and you are producing if you are producing any fruits so of your labors that it's um, actually productive so it's it's a challenging question and it's something that we should continue to really talk about. When we say 30 to 50% of productive areas, that includes the sea as well, because the sea is the largest carbon sink that we have. And we need to think about that too, um, from the kelp that grows in it to just the action of the waves absorbing carbon into the ocean. Um, and it's not just carbon either, right? <laughs> it's me saying, yeah, from, from our desire to slaughter and eat the flesh of our fellow beings that share our planet you know and um and so it, it's one of those things is you know we're all connected you know and the love and compassion for all living beings including things like pigs and cows um, it's a lack of love and compassion for them which which is destroying the destruction of ourselves and the planet and it's our love and compassion for other living beings from where there's a pig in america to orangutans in indonesia all that is going to benefit us, you know, and because 
the, as I mentioned before, it's not the environment versus the economy. We, we, have, we have exploitative economies now, which pass the true cost of production onto the powerless. Um, Non-recognised persons such as orangutans, indigenous communities, powerless people, as an example. But m more importantly, in, in the context, is future generations. We're passing on the true cost of production to future generations. Um, and, and, and therefore, it's not saying we don't. We want a great economy. We want to be prosperous. Yeah, but we want to do it in a way that doesn't exploit other living beings. You know, um, and so it becomes a genuine, sustainable economy that benefits all. And so, and the future I'm envisaging is not a future of um, we all becoming impoverished to save the planet, you know, or sacrificing. The future is actually a one of affluence and, and beauty, you know, and, and, and living fantastic, meaningful lives. Um, but we just got to rejig our economy from this obsession with short term exploitation. Well, here, here. I mean, we talk about simple things like the true cost of a T-shirt, right? You know, you probably shouldn't pay just $5 for a T-shirt at Ross Dress for Less. Yeah, if you are doing that, then you're essentially, you're borrowing from the future. And yeah. you're also understanding, or you should understand that that was built for five dollars that you're buying at a store because somebody else sacrificed their livelihood or the forest behind their home to create land for cotton farming or something of that sort so we need to think in this more regenerative way and i know at times that can seem very overwhelming too so what i'd like to do as we prepare to wrap today's show is really talk about what people can do and how they can empower themselves whether it be through donation or through action in their local communities and and ultimately to really help them understand how they can be of help to the orangutan, the elephants that you mentioned, and to the other beings on this planet. Yeah, I mean, surprisingly, I, I would say, look, everyone's first duty in life is to be cheerful. <laughs> you know, to, to, yeah, find that joy and love within yourself. And you can't find it externally, you know. Um, because if you're cheerful and ha have joy and love within you, you have two things. You want to help others. Just as if you're in pain, you naturally spread pain. You can't help it. Mm -hmm. If you have joy and happiness within yourself, you naturally have to spread that. And it's not going to be um, limited by external circumstances. So you have the resilience to move on. So, I, and I put it another way, we can't reform the world unless we reform ourselves. So that's, yes. I think, the first duty in our lives. Now, and then the only thing is, I call it two wings of the bird. We, we not, most charity is wasted uh, and um, causes more problems than it solves. And so I call it the two wings of the bird. We not only have to have the love and compassion of other living beings to make a meaningful change, we have to have the second wing of intellect intelligently applying um, that love and compassion otherwise the bird will fly around in circles so we need those two wings and so th then i'll say you got to at least do some research and, and and intelligently apply your love and compassion for other living beings um, to ensure that it makes the meaningful change that you want to um, in the world and 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 then of course as i touched on before if at all possible please collectivize because, you know, as orangutans do, they adapt to the environment through culture. And the wonderful thing about culture is you gain all the knowledge in this sense from all the orangutans that live in your community. Everything they learn, you learn through the culture. But far more importantly, if an orangutan a thousand years ago discovered that this plant helps treat malaria, you know it. You know, um, and it's the same with human beings, you know. You, You'd be surprised how little we know and what we actually think we know we don't know which is there's other people in our culture that know that and, and we have the privilege of owning that that bit of knowledge so by collectivizing we can we can really um accelerate our power you know my my big um, example of this is carbon footprints and everyone talks about carbon footprints and we go and i'm not saying we shouldn't do that but that was created by british petroleum yeah that's right. one of one of a hundred companies that's caused 90 percent of climate change now why have they done that for two reasons to say well it's not our fault which is right it's your fault 
you better get your act together. And of course, as an individual, you have no power. And I know. Also, Can we just laugh con- at it for a minute? It's it's the most <laughs> ridiculous thing. It's yeah. And, and by you concentrating on one about your carbon footprint, right, you are no longer in the mindset to collectivize to make sure those people who are billionaires from destroying the planet are held to account, you know. And so, you know, we're off, we're sold as pup, if that makes sense, you know, of, you know, act, you know, think globally, act locally. Well, act locally is fine, but the trouble is impoverished people and destruction of for, for goods and services which support our economies are coming from developing nations. That's and right. if we don't understand and act there, the planet will be destroyed, you know, and, and, the, and eventually our economy and environment in the developed world. So this whole idea we've been sold these, um, in a sense, um, maybe a strong word, but anyone I can think, think of at the moment, lies doesn't make sense. Of, of our individual efficacy, you know, um, which 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 is allow them to delay meaningful action on climate change and and conservation, so their assets are not of oil, gas, and and you know a, a animal industry aren't um, stranded, you know. But we can't be fooled because we've only got the next day to make the meaningful change, and we can't allow them to get away with this misdirection. Well, and the type of misdirection um, and the spirit of that misdirection, I've been contacted by several oil and gas executives over the course of the last couple of years, asking to come on this podcast and talk about how oil companies and natural gas companies need to be part of the transition and solution of climate change. <laughs> I'm just like, no, <laughs> you yeah, can't it, it, come it, it, on it. and, and <laughs> leave your spin in my audience's ears. It's not yeah, going to happen. What, they do that everywhere. The idea is, from their point of view, is they know that the writing's on the wall, that everyone now realizes that they're destroying the planet. And then, then they're going, and so the idea is let's delay change. And one of the tactics is to say we have to transition and we have to be part of the solution and, mm-hmm. and that sort of stuff. Rather than saying, hold it, if you're too, you know, you've been too selfish, yeah, that makes sense to lead the transition. And you could have done that instead of climate denial, you know, 30 years ago, start transitioning to um, renewables. And you could have been leaders of Instead of putting new oil rigs off of the coast of the ocean, they, they could have been putting wind farms at sea. It, 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 exactly. And so, mm-hmm. you know, why should we as a planet pay for your bad business mistakes? You know, this exactly. is this is the beauty of capitalism. Is what we should do if it's not crony capitalism, i.e., they're not influencing decisions of government policy makers, but real capitalism. You know, those businesses which have made bad decisions by you know uh, by investing in old technologies that you know that need to go away should go out of business, and we should actually allow new businesses which are investing in the new economy and new technology to thrive. You know, and so. You know, in that, so what we really need to do is also is, is, is remove crony capitalism <laughs> and allow true capitalism, doesn't make sense, those who benefit and provide goods and services without exploitation to us to prosper. And yeah, and I, I really, again, as, I, as you probably felt, I believe those people have no place in, in the dialogue, you know, um, because, you know, they're, they're, they're using their power and influence to misdirect not only us, but our democracies yeah, um, to making the meaningful change we need to do for the benefit of the people. 100%. Now, I, I don't know if you've had the pleasure of listening to a couple of my guest episodes with some climate aware individuals like Sephora Berman of Stand.Earth and Champion for the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, no, but really... The work is long, it's arduous, it's getting entire countries to sign on to a agreement that they'll essentially say, we're no more oil, you know, we're, we're going to put this to bed, no, no new contracts, no new drilling, no new anything when it comes to oil. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a big step. And there are now countries that are signing on to that fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So it's nice to see but we need to get big countries, big economies committed to those things too. And when we do, 
because it's when now, not if it has to be. And I, I stand behind that because you see rising changes in our climates around the globe and hotter summers and colder winters in different spots than you would mm-hmm. see as normal flooding and fires like never before because of how dramatically we've altered our own ecosystems around the globe already. And because of climate lag, it's going to take time for these real changes that we put into effect to, for us to see the benefit of them. But if we don't make moves now, then, you know, two generations down the road, we may not have an environment that can sustain us anymore. Mm-hmm. And yes, no, that's, the, that's the hard truth. It will have been our own doing. So change things now, get involved, Mm -hmm. find something you're passionate about, the orangutan, fossil fuel treaty, (laughs) whatever it is, get activated. Mm -hmm. Um, I also had one guest who I connect with on a periodic basis. She's become a friend, Beth Craig. And she likes to say that she just thinks we should be paying more for everything. And if we take this mindset of, you know, yeah, my t-shirt needs to cost more because it needs to be made responsibly. Or if it doesn't, um, and I happen to have dabbled in something that I got for a steal, then perhaps I should put more money into a project like the orangutan project. I should put more resources into these things and look at them as a tax on something that I was perhaps less than responsible on. Um, And I think we can make those moves if we are committed to being responsible citizens. If we have a little bit of extra, as opposed to those that are living on a dime, then we can make those choices and we can live a little differently. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's two, two aspects to that. One is yes, we are living for no fault of our own, a slightly higher standard from the exploitation of others you mm-hmm. know, because of the economic system that we were forced to live in. And if we return some of that, into a, a charity that's making a, a genuine, me, meaningful, measurable change, then I think that's the moral obligation of ourselves. But the other aspect to it is, is uh, I probably just have a little di- difference of opinion, is that we have to, in a sense, spend more. In, in, in the sense of, um, the since the 1970s, the, um, the middle class has been destroyed Effect, wages effective with after inflation haven't gone up, in fact, gone backwards. But the economy is booming. And so inflation is actually driven by increasingly large corporate profits and, you know, and feeding the, the, the increased wealth of the, of the 1% of the 1%. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and it, after all, it doesn't make sense because these billionaires can't actually spend all the money that, they, that, that, that they're accumulated. And so I would argue that the most of the money is, is, that we're, we're seeing is, that you spend is, is not going to pay for, you know, the production <laughs> of the goods and services. But no, it's going to the top. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, 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 th- and they're making the money from exploitation, not um, providing a meaningful goods and services. And so it's almost in, in some ways we've, you know, lost control of democracies to particular interests. And that's why, you know, so, um, and the only reason I, I mentioned that is, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I believe we can have a prosperous, doesn't make sense, an affluent future, you know, um, for all living beings, you know. Um, it doesn't have, we don't have to seem to have this trade off, that makes sense, of impoverishment, which I think is, you know, um, is, is not. It's not the right way of looking at it, of, of what, what um, environmentalists and conservationists are, are trying to achieve. Yeah. Well, I don't think I disagree with you at all there. It's um, perhaps a different way of stating some of the same. But as it comes to the scent of billionaires in the world, why does this even make sense? It doesn't. It's... No. It, 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 it doesn't make sense at all. Um, for them, I mean, look, if you're, if you're miserable... Um, bastard, you know, <laughs> with with two billion, four billion is not going to make you any happier. You know, mm-hmm. you know, if it's, it's not, it's, it's no value for them. If that makes sense, it's almost a, a, it's like a cancer cell. You know, the cancer cell keeps wanting to grow and grow, and it's destroying the host, right? 
and you, uh, you get, he's trying to say to his cancer cells, hey, <laughs> you know, I, I love you too, but you know, you, you know, your, your, your insane growth, you know, is, um, don't hold even value for yourself, need yeah. to loan others. And, 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 and therefore, let, let's not do that. Let, let's, let's, let's work for a better world. And it's, again, what I'm trying to emphasize is, um, hate or, 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 um, or belittling anybody or person is not the right idea. So I'm trying to emphasize, does it make sense? The better world we're looking for is actually good for the billionaires and the millionaires. You know, it's not bad for them either, you know, but it, but it's eventually going to be better for them, you know, um, but, but they're unfortunately stuck into a mentality of, um, of crony capitalism and exploitation. Yeah. Um, which for even their benefit, we, we, we need to slow them down. You know? Yeah. And, well, what do they say? It's it lonely at the top, right? And so you have somebody who has so much more wealth than everybody else. It's almost separates them and divorces them from community. And I think that's part yeah. of the reason even that they oh, might even be inspired to just keep at, keep at getting more and more and more because there's a dissatisfaction with life. It, exactly. It, it, yeah. It's actually, they're very sad individuals in some senses and you know, we have to have an empathy for them. And this yeah. is, you know, and, and most in a sense, healthy <laughs> individuals would never put themselves in that position because the, the costs are horrific, um, not only for the planet, um, but for themselves as individuals. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a, it's a very big issue that I don't know that we'll be able to dismantle in a decade, but I hope we can make progress. I um, see that, you know, we've, we've essentially kind of grown into a society here in the United States where we almost incentivize monopoly <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> and I thought we were an anti-monopolistic or anti-oligarchy, but it's not really proving to be the case. I mean, Amazon's replacing everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> as yeah, are the Googles example, of the world. So it, what do you exactly. do? Well, unfortunately, you know, since, I mean, the, the greatest social act in, in history, which created the most prosperous time we've, in place and time we've ever seen is a new deal in America. Yeah. As an example, you know, we, we created so much benefits and wealth, not only for America, but, but the planet. And, you know, and that has been dismantled. And, you know, and, and to so many ways, we've lost, not only in America, but all over the world, we've lost control of our democracies to, um, you know, um, you know, interests of a few individuals, you know, and one of the things we need to do is regain our democracies, you know, and, um, and you know, and have a, a fair world. And so, um, you know, we can prosper because ultimately, if the rich get richer and the poor keep getting poorer, where are all the consumers to buy their goods and services? You know, <laughs> ultimately, it's a zero sum game, you know. It is a and zero then, sum game. And what if more of us become minimalists and then suddenly we're opting out of that <laughs> consumerist lifestyle anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So, what do you do that? You know? Yeah, well, it, 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 exactly. And of course, you know, I mean, poverty sucks, you know. Um, but once we get out of poverty, what we know or the research tells us is once we get over a certain level of income, there is no net gain in happiness from increasingly putting gold on a mule's back. It, you know, and, and, and so, you know, we, we really have to look at um, societies and, and ways of living which actually make us happy, you know, um, rather than, um, you know, um, this belief that you know more wealth um, and more mature possessions will um, somehow in the future materialize in more happiness unfortunately the research shows that that simply doesn't happen and our billionaire friends that we're talking about here are, you know obviously miserable um, you know demonstrate to us every day yeah well, I so appreciate the conversation. I do have an individual coming on soon. I'm going to be interviewing the CEO of Charity Navigator. And I mentioned that because something else I've heard you talk about on other podcasts is learning to identify responsible charities. And so that's something I'll be discussing with him. 
Do you have any tips about how people can identify responsible charities if they want to nominate one to be their monthly mm-hmm. giving cycle or annual, just some, some companies that they want to support with their dollars? Yeah, I mean, often they, they focus on administration costs or, um, you know, putting the annual report and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, sure, all that's important, but you can do all that and achieve nothing, you know. And so what I say is you are what you measure, you know. And so let's say a charity gets a million dollars. Well, what other measurable outcome do you achieve with that? And let's say if you're an orangutan conservation, how many orangutans you've saved, how many you released, how many wild populations are secured under your protection? How much rainforest have you secured? You know, measure those things. Does that make sense? And put those in your annual report and impact statements. And don't worry about the process in between as much, but worry about what are the genuine measurable outcomes. The trouble is, what happens is charities and you know, and, and charity regulators measure the, the things in between. If that makes sense, you know, hmm. and that's not how you measure impact you know because as i mentioned i believe that most charity money is wasted you know it, it, it doesn't doesn't make sense through through a various levels of processes so i always just say to people don't worry too much about the other stuff look at the annual report and say okay you've achieved you've got this much is a, are you actually measuring the outcome mm-hmm. that's the main thing and if you're measuring let's have a quick look at it and, and see if that's really an effective use of outcomes for the dollars that, that you're getting. And I think that's the best way to um, measure charities that we give to. Fantastic. Well, Leif, I'd love to ask you if there's a closing thought that you'd like to leave our audience with, or perhaps a question you wish I asked that I haven't. Um, no, it, it just said, um, thank you for having us on. Um, the, the connection um, with other people and, um, and and collectivizing in such ways that we can together make a meaningful change is, is, is wonderful. And yeah, and of course, the orangutan project is not the only um, good charity to support. Um, but we do offer if you have that love and compassion um, as, a, as, a, as one way of making that meaningful change in a world that um, We'll, we'll leave a better planet for all living beings. Hmm. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me today, Leif. Thank you very much. To learn more about Leif Cox and the Orangutan Project, visit theorangutanproject.org. You can also connect with them on Instagram at the Orangutan Project. As always, you can visit our show notes for direct links to everywhere that they are active. And when you visit caremorebebetter.com, you'll find so much more, including complete transcripts for this episode, expanded show notes, and bonus features. You'll also find links and additional resources that we mentioned during today's episode. While you're visiting, I hope that you'll sign up for our newsletter. Subscribers receive a welcome gift, which is a five-step guide to help you get organized, inspire your activism, and collective change. It serves as a great project management tool. Now, if you have feedback or want to suggest a future show topic, please send me an email or leave me a voicemail directly from the site too. You'll even notice a microphone icon in the bottom right-hand corner. You can click on that and leave me a message. Thank you listeners and watchers now and always for being a part of this pod and this community because together we really can do so much more. We can care more, we can be better, We can even return the orangutan to their formal glory, create a better future for them and all of Earth's inhabitants. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good. 